morning. I'm Katie from Team Bite Me. My teammates and I are here to talk about some common models we use for modeling the spread of the disease. Now, before we go into the different models, I would like to start us off with some information about the general components of a disease model. When, we, when you look at a disease model, first you want to know if it organizes the populations as individuals or as compartments. For example, an SIR model divides populations into three compartments, susceptible, infectious, and recovered. On top of these three compartments, some models would subdivide the populations into a set of divisions that are relevant for the specific disease. An example of that would be a divisions for children within a compartment, maybe because um, we think that children are more susceptible to COVID-19. And then secondly, we want to see if the outcome is deterministic which means that it can be predetermined based on the rules that were applied to the models. If you look at the graph on the top left, you can see that the outcome is incrementing on a constant rate, and that is an example of a deterministic model. Secondly, um, you would want to see if that's not a deterministic model, you want to see if that's a stochastic model. Um, the outcome of a stochastic model would um, depends on the past data. And some benefits of a deterministic model is that um, we can characterize what the average outcome might be in a very simple and interpretable way. Then we can get an average shape of the patterns. If you look at um, the top right pictures of the graph, you can see that there is a simple pattern of outcome. However, with the deterministic models, we can never accurately predict any um, outbreak since we're only getting the simple patterns. And with the stochastic model, it is beneficial when we're using it to represent uncertainty in potential outcomes, because it provides a range at each time that captures all the observed points. While the downside of this is that because there is a range, you can only get a fuzzy answer with a potential error. Now we want to ask ourselves, why do we need programming for modeling the spread of the disease? Well, first of all, the calculation is complicated. A model that modeling the spread of the disease would have lots of variables and the data are constantly changing and updating. You will want to keep the accuracy when you're analyzing all these data. And this is why we're choosing programming over all other methods. Now I'll pass on to my teammate, Henry, to talk about our first model, the SIR model. In this presentation, we will mostly talk about compartmental models. The first model we'll, we'll discuss is the SIR model. This model divides the population into three compartments, the susceptible, the infectious, and the recovered compartment. And, and in this model, individuals migrate between susceptible, infectious, and recovered. As they move into the recovered state, it is assumed that they are permanently immune to the disease. And will, and will no longer contribute to its spread. Um, sometimes the recovered group is, is called removed because um, people who die could also, be classif could also be put in this category since they, also no longer, since they no longer contribute to its spread. Um, the SIR model is useful for modeling diseases like measles, which confer lifelong immunity. immunity. So at any given time, n is equal to s plus i plus r, where n is the size of the population, s is the number of people who are susceptible, i is the number of people who are infectious, and r is the number of people who recovered. The SIR model uses differential equations to represent how individuals migrate between the three compartments. So in the first equation, we see d of s over d of t is equal to negative beta si over n. Beta refers to the contact rate at which how, how susceptible and, and, and infected people come together. SI um, is being multiplied together since this represents contact between each other. And it's being divided by N since this is a fraction of the total population. Um, the rate is negative since we would expect as time goes on for more and more people to become 
um, to, uh, infected and recovered and less people to be susceptible to them. Yes, and the people who are leaving the susceptible group are joining the infected group, so that's why it's positive here. But in the infected group, we also have to account for the number of people who are moving to the recovered group. And that's denoted as YI, and that's being added to the, yeah, and that's why it's being added to the recovered group. The SIRS model is similar to the SIR model, but now people who are recovered, people in the recovered group may move back to the susceptible group, since now it is, it is assumed that diseases no longer confer um, lifelong immunity, and sometimes the, immu and the immunity is temporary. Um, studies suggest that actually COVID-19 confers temporary immunity, so the SIRS model might be more appropriate than the other, than the than the other, than the SIR model, as you'll see later. Um, and yeah, this is not, the equation's very similar. Now it's, now we have to account for that in the recovered group, the recovered equation and the susceptible equation, as you can see. Um, the SEIR and the SEIR models add a force compartment, exposed individuals. Um, just like all compartmental models, n is still equal to s plus e plus i plus r, all of the, the sum of the number of people in each compartment. Um, however, um, the, I mean, it, the SEIR model and the SEIRS models now um, denote the rate at which people uh, leave the exposed group and join the infectious group as sigma e, as sigma, and e is the number of people in the exposed group. Um, and it's useful for modeling diseases where there's an incubation period in, in individuals are not yet exposed, but not yet, not yet ex infected, but, but are exposed. But however, this is still bad, still bad if you want to model COVID-19, since COVID-19, in COVID-19, individuals with the virus are con con contagious, even in, its incubate, even in their incubation period. The SI and SIS models are the simplest con compartmental models. They divide a population into a susceptible and infected group. In the, SI, in the SI model, once individuals become infected, they stay infected for the rest of their lives. And this is specific, this is good for modeling like certain diseases like some STDs or like herpes. Um, in the SIS model, um, individuals may become infected repeatedly. So they move back from the infectious group to the susceptible groups into the susceptible group. And it, it's good for modeling common codes like the adenovirus. And now I will pass it on to Manjiri. Uh, so some limitations of the compartmental model is that the population size has to remain constant or else this model would not work theoretically. So um, that would mean that throughout this pandemic, no migrations would have to happen between the within the populations. And, another, and that would also assume that the rates of infection and susceptibility are constant throughout this pandemic, which is not the case since people can take certain measures such as wearing gloves or masks or taking proper hygienic um, measures in order to stop the spread of infection throughout, um, throughout populations. Another limitation is that also is that fact that the um, this model does not factor for birth or and death rates and um, individuals immune to a disease as explained earlier may die off and if a uh, birth rate is higher than the death rate the disease is able to sustain itself in the population um, ways that we can improve on this model is we can implement birth and death birth and death rates in our co compartmental models um, in each compartment, V of S people would die due to causes unrelated to the disease. Uh, people born into the population denoted as mu N are susceptible. So the first equation would account for this. Um, another possible improvement is that, oh, that we could add to the compartmental model is that in the real world, a uh, pandemic may spread across multiple countries. So realistically, um, therefore, uh, instead of one isolated population, we could have multiple populations that are capable of infecting each other. Um, the figure on the right, it shows an SI model for two populations. The, po the change of infections over time in the population 
one, for example, is equal to the rate at which infected from population two come into contact with those who are susceptible from population one. And that is added to the rate at which, infect, which those who are infected from population one come into contact with those who are susceptible from population one. Um, I will now be passing it on to uh, Vivek, who will be explaining the real life applications of this model. Thank you. So in this graph, here's a Python coding package we found for the spreading of the coronavirus. And we took the code and made a few modifications to model it after it. Uh, for example, we made the average length of infection two weeks and increased its infectivity. My teammates and I used two of the models that we mentioned before, the SIR and SIRS models. As a quick reminder, SIR means susceptible, infectious, and recovered with inoculation. SIRS means susceptible, infectious, and recovered without inoculation, meaning they're susceptible again. Looking at the SIR graph, the susceptibility of the population decreases drastically over time because of the developed immunity those infected and survive get. The green line shows people who have recovered with immunity and people who died from the disease, both of which curbed the spread of the virus. The number of susceptible people decrease as the green line increases, and the number of infected peak at the same time they intersect. I still don't know why this is the case. This model does not make sense when using it for the coronavirus because as of now, there is no evidence that people gain immunity after getting infected. In the next graph, we used an SIRS model and we implemented upon the SIS coding package to get a new SIRS model. Simply changing the model completely changed how the graph looked. Near the end of the year long time period, the graph almost seems to stabilize in the form in some sort of equation. The number of susceptible people in increases after it's dipped due to there being no more inoculation post infection, while the number of recovered with temporary immunity, immunity decreases due to a similar reason. The graph of the infected remains roughly the same, however, because of the infection cycle of infection remains the same. This is one of the best models for the coronavirus because it shows that people don't get inoculation after getting infected. So what? What was the point of all this? Different models have different kinds of uses, and having a one-track mind is dangerous, especially in computational biology. Various ways of showing the different kinds of information can show different connections between different pieces of information. We may not know all the answers, but keeping an open mind and creating templates for new situations we find gives us proficiency in all things computation and biology. Uh, here are our citations, and thank you so much for listening.